Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I am the uh, head of public programs here at the Old State House, and we're delighted to have you with us today for this program. Um, it's very appropriate to be doing a series of programs on the Connecticut Constitution of 1818 since some of the discussions for that new constitution were held here in the Old State House. Um, we are delighted to co-sponsor this program with our colleagues at Connecticut Explored, the magazine of Connecticut history. If you have not already, I put out some extra issues at the back that are free to take. Please help yourself. And if you are not a su subscriber yet, consider um, joining up because it's a great magazine and lots of wonderful articles. We would like to also thank our funders for this series, Connecticut Humanities, who provided the funds to support this series. And um, as you know, this program was rescheduled since we had a snow day in March. Um, and I didn't think we'd be having more snow days in April, but luckily not for today. Um, so after today's program, do join us again on April the 17th for the debates at the 1818 Constitutional Convention. And then we'll take a little break and have three programs in the fall. All of you have uh, surveys on your uh, chairs. Please fill them out. We do really read them and appreciate your feedback on them. And um, you can hand it to myself or another staff member after the program. There also is a little flyer reminding you about the program on April the 17th. <clears throat> Today's program, um, which we're delighted to welcome you to today, is on the collapse of Connecticut Federalist dominance in our state. Today's speaker, Dr. Richard Buell, Jr., um, is a graduate of Amherst College and had a PhD in history at Harvard University. He taught American history at Wesleyan University for 40 years, staying on afterwards for a decade as a resident scholar. During that time, he published six monographs and one reference work on the American the American Revolutionary Era. He also oversaw the publication of three Acorn Club titles, including Original Discontents, um, com Commentaries on the Creation of Connecticut's Constitution of 1818, a, a book that we use quite a lot here at the Old State House as a reference book. So please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Buell to the Old State House. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and um, also thank you for inviting me to join the conversation, because I've been sort of out of the mainstream for a while. I, I'm not as young as most of you are out there, and um, so it's fun to be, come back uh, after a, a uh, interval and be part of the fun. Thank you again for that. So, um, my uh, title is Collapse of Connecticut F Federalism, a Necessary Precursor to uh, the Constitution of 1818. I'm not uh, a pro with, with uh, PowerPoint, so let's see what happens. And something did happen. Ah, yes. So I take you back. Some of you were probably at Walter's wonderful presentation six weeks ago, and uh, I believe its title was, It Was the Best of Times, The, the Worst of Times, and that's a... Uh, for, what, phrase taken from Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. Uh, you can see a cover of one of the reissues there. And he used it to describe uh, Connecticut um, leading up to the Constitution of 1818. And as I listened to it, I thought, uh, woe is me. Perhaps the most appropriate title would be A Hard Act to Follow, or at least some title. Uh, and so I was wondering, as I listened to him, what I would do but I actually figured out something to do, and that, that was to address an issue which may seem like a non-issue to some of you, but if you oppose people who think, on the one hand, that it's the best of all possible worlds, on the other, the worst of all possible worlds, how do you get them together? And we didn't uh, have a violent resolution of this conflict, but um, so you might say it's not an issue, but actually it's more of an issue than you might think, I think. And I'm going to try and uh, at least support that. Um, first of all, you can't say we don't do that sort of thing because we did it, did the, we had some spectacular riots in Baltimore in 1812, just after the declaration of the War of 1812. And um, they involved the uh, violent suppression of the Federal Republican, which was a Federalist newspaper that denounced the war as it was um, 
as it began, and for that it was uh, trashed by a mob. And then um, the publisher, a man called a Alexander L. Hansen, went off to, to Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, he uh, resumed publication, but it, that, that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to resume publication in downtown Baltimore, which he did, uh, with, with the help of Light Horse, Harry Lee, and a few, about 30 other Federalists, and they acquired a well-built house, which uh, General Lee said was defensible, and issued another issue of the Federal Republican, and this is what happened. And that's a picture of a whole-scale riot, and in the front are the rioters, and to the left is Fort, this is Fort Hansen. They've already killed one figure here. This is a militia who's gonna try and break it up. They negotiate a, a deal, the, the rioters retire, the uh, militia takes the, the uh, inhabitants of Fort Hansen off to jail for their own safety. Um, the militia goes home, the jailer goes home, the mob reassembles and beats the um, uh, former inhabitants of Fort Hansen to jelly. And they actually kill one guy, they maim uh, Lee for the rest of his life. Um, and so we, we don't behave uniformly nicely. Um, so that's not, not a uh, justification for not taking the possibility that this could have led to violence seriously. But you might say, we are the land of steady habits. We don't do that sort of thing. Uh, we we, we uh, um, uh, don't engage in mob rule. But I think that doesn't do justice to where Hartford found itself in 1814, because after the uh, Connecticut accepted that the convention, uh, the Hartford Convention would take place in this very building, um, the Madison administration responded by assigning the 25th Regiment to winter here and recruit. And uh, they, they had, some of them had been recruited in Connecticut and they went off to their homes on furlough. But they were proximate um, uh, to Hartford and there was always a detachment in Hartford and their presence was extremely unwelcome because they were doing something that the Federalist fathers of the town vehemently opposed, which was recruiting for the army. But they were doing other things as well because the officers were the, the most exciting social addition to the town um, that it had seen in a long time. And one of the customs in, in this period of our history was to have these autumn, winter, and spring cotillions. And there are small parties uh, held in, in private homes often. Uh, and here, here you see a man in military uniform. Um, this is probably an English scene, but nonetheless you get the point. And um, what, what this represented was a shifting of a social center of gravity from the Federalists to the Republicans because the, the most exciting thing in town were these heroes from um, the Battle of Lundy's Lane. And uh, so you can just hear the Federalist parents having to cope with their daughter's, um, what, mischievous comments about why aren't we attending those parties. And you can hear these, these uh, Republican women telling their Federalist counterparts how exciting these guys are who come from outside. Then when the convention actually gets going, the uh, 25th is even, it misbehaves even more and it gets into files of drummers and fifers and flag bearers and they march around all over town and they march around this building while they're trying to deliberate. And uh, this is uh, somewhat distracting, um, uh, to put it mildly, uh, uh, quite apart from, from its utility in reminding the convention that if they wanted to secede, that would be disputed by force. So uh, I'm not saying that uh, th this, this breeds violence in itself, but after the convention disbands, the common council of the uh, town um, passes a stringent law, uh, by law, which they're empowered by the legislature to do, to um, uh, forbid parades, and they actually levy a, a a fine on every violation, which could run up to big money over time, uh, 
And then the Connecticut legislature comes up here for an emergency session in January of 1815, and they pass a draconian law whose intent is to nullify the Conscription Act of 1814, which is a uh, um, statute of Congress designed to try and beef up the army. And they, this law imposes a $100 penalty on anyone who's advocating um, enlisting in the army and a $500 penalty if you actually succeed in getting a recruit, which uh, as Colonel Thomas Jessup, the commander of the 25th and the hero of Lundy's, Lundy's Lane, um, reported to his superiors amounted to nullification. And he obviously wanted authority to do something about this, and you can imagine what <laughs> that would have been. And uh, over here, is um, an image of a riot. I think it's French. The reason why I think it's French is this person's either hung by a lantern or his head is about to be on a pike. And we don't do that sort of thing, I suspect, but we do just about everything else. And um, th the point is that there are people on both sides willing to push matters to a crisis. And I, I can't guarantee a crisis would have occurred, but there's a lot more going on here than you uh, might want to think. And a, a, a ferocious tensions are involved. And so what I'm uh, going to address is where these ferocious tensions come from. And uh, what I have to contribute to um, uh, the conversation about the Constitution of 1818 is uh, the, that to understand what's going on in Connecticut, you really have to look beyond the borders of Connecticut. So that's my... my uh, contribution to this series. So, and the answer I'm going to suggest is it's really located in an international drama centered on the French Revolution, um, and that those who think this is the best of times actually are scared to death of the French Revolution, and that unites all the desperate uh, constituencies in the Federalist con Coalition. So uh, why were they so scared? Well, this is what they thought of when you said French Revolution to them. See, see all those nice, recently severed heads on pikes, and that's the, these guys in blue are the, the, um, the National Guard, and they're tolerating this kind of savagery. And that's followed by, you know, destruction, violence of, of, of property and, and people, followed by the execution of Louis XVI, and that's, that's just the first of more than 3,000 people have their heads severed from their shoulders and over the next year and a half in the Place de, de Concorde, followed by your friend Boney, who um, first of all turns the artillery against the uh, people of Paris and then goes out and conquers all the neighbors of France and then finally makes himself into the emperor, which is not exactly what you want coming out of a Republican revolution. So I would suggest that Frederick's ideology is essentially a defensive response to France's descent into savagery and its evolution into despotism. And uh, you, that may be hard to um, uh, what believe. Uh, why should um, they be worried? Because after all, we are the United States of America, and that's you know Europe. That's so far away. But what you have to remember is that France at this time, had the reputation of being the leading nation in terms of culture and civility. And um, so this was very disturbing. And we aren't very old, and we, we're not quite sure which way we're going. <laughs> uh, we, we don't feel that stable, particularly the people in Connecticut don't feel that stable. So um, if, if you take that attitude, then, and there happens to be a war uh, between the uh, great European powers of Britain and, and France during this period, then you will come to look on Britain as your stable defense against both Napoleonic despotism, uh, but beyond that, believe it or not, such things as Christianity and even civilization itself. So th 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 there is a tendency in ideology to escalate um, the stakes, and this is how they, they go in this particular time. And the obverse of that is you look in your 
domestic adversaries as allies of the tra hostile transnational forces, and um, you worry about their partiality for France courting a war with Britain that will jacobinize America. And the reason why they felt it would jacobinize America is because during the revolution, we've been thrust into the arms of uh, Fran France, the French as allies, and it had affected uh, how we developed. And we were, it, it, it was legitimate to worry that that would be even worse on the next time around. But beyond that, you know, even religious dissenters who are Christians uh, can be construed as um, compromising the attempt to uh, wage the essential uh, defense of Christianity against uh, infidelity. So that, that, those are ideological issues which are peculiar to the period, and that, that to me is what epitomizes federalist ideology at this point. So what I'm going to argue is that there are consequences to adopting this worldview. Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's essentially a defensive uh, perspective, and uh, it um, is not terribly well represented, I think, uh, um, by the, the idea of it was the best of times. They may have said it was the best of times, but I don't think they really thought that. Secondly, I'm going to argue it led to self-destructive actions, which precipitated their collapse. My title is Collapse of Federalism. That suggests they're doing it to themselves. It's not being done to them. And thirdly, ironically, and there'll be some other ironies in this presentation, it also helps to lead, pave a way to a peaceful resolution of this. Now let's go back to the beginning, which is the Charter of 1662. That may seem like an ironic place to begin to identify the origins of the Federalist insecurity because they're clinging to a form of government that essentially is, a, is uh, the Charter of 1662 and 1818. And the problem with this government initially was it was pretty popular. It, it, uh, they construed it in such a way that it mandated two popular elections of representatives to a General Assembly a year, and that was checked by, could only be checked by a governor, deputy governor, and 12 assistants who were elected annually. And they did develop electoral procedures to ensure, try and ensure the stability of the uh, governor, deputy governor, and assistants um, uh, by almost guaranteeing their being elected from year to year until they perish. But um, that, that didn't all, always work, as we shall shortly see. Now, um, this, the, a popular government, you say, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, what's wrong with that in 1662 is it's just after the Cromwellian period, and that, that hasn't given excessively popular governments a terribly good reputation. And uh, this particular government is faced with an array of problems, which they handle rather well, though I'm not sure they enjoy doing it in the process. They absorbed New Haven Colony against its will. It hadn't been consulted um, in, in, the, um, in, being, in the Charter of 1662. And that was followed by King Philip's War. That's followed by a very dramatic expansion in population after 1690, when the population triples in about 30 years which is an unheard of rate of expansion in the late 17th and early 18th century. And it's largely due to internal migration uh, for reasons which should be evident in this map. Um, the places, the uh, King Philip's War had the effect of neutralizing or eliminating the presence of the Native American in this area right here. That means that Eastern Massachusetts um, is sending all its sons and daughters who need new uh, lands to into, into that part of the state. And if so what, what we're having in, in the period from 1690 until 1730, uh, essentially, is um, internal migration uh, into unoccupied lands and the rapid development of this, which leads to some interesting disorders. Now, I'm not going to bore you with going over this again, because Dick Bushman has done it in the classic fashion in his book, From Puritan to Yankee, in which he describes the political turmoil, uh, the great awakening growing out of it, the religious disorders that grow out of this rapid expansion, although the great awakening goes be, extends beyond um, eastern Connecticut, obviously. Uh, 
but uh, the Susquehanna Company, which is a, a uh, particular manifestation of this uh, rapid expansion in the 1750s, now, which I will come back to in just a minute. But let's move on to a revolution. Now, uh, uh, the, the revolution posed an interesting problem in the Stamp Act. That was a pre-revolutionary event. There was no ambiguity about how Connecticut regarded that, hostily. And, um, but it, it did have a provision in the, the law saying that the governor should swear to uphold it. And he actually got four counselors to administer the oath and um, they were rewarded for that by being sacked on the next rotation of election. So, uh, and that's despite the um, procedures which, which are in place to, to, to try and ensure continuity. What's more interesting to me is the Susquehanna Company. Uh, that's a um, Eastern Connecticut company that is attempting to grab land from Pennsylvania, believe it or not. You may wonder, how could they possibly have the chutzpah to do that? Well, the answer is they're trying to get their charter um, of 1662, in effect, to take the place of the Penn's charter of 1681. Um, and uh, the logic behind that is that Pennsylvania is a Quaker colony and uh, it didn't behave very well militarily during the Seven Years' War and Connecticut did. Connecticut's actually a militarized society by the end of the uh, Seven Years' War. And so uh, if we have a showdown with Britain and there's a nice short war and we end up in um, independent, then it'd be nice to have possession of North Central Pennsylvania as well um, because possession is nine-tenths of the law. So um, the, the, the General Assembly starts incorporating the, the, this company enterprise into its official structure. It creates Westmoreland County, accepts representatives from the towns out there in the general court. It's crazy. And instead of a short war, a triumphant war, they get a long war that, that uh, uh, leaves the state uh, economically prostrate. And um, so that raises the question, of course, of why Connecticut is so victimized by the revolution. And uh, the, the reason for that uh, is that it, we, we lack any strategic uh, significance and we are vulnerable uh, uh, to uh, loyalist raiding. And this uh, map, um, I hope, will illustrate the point. That these are the strategic points. New York, Newport, believe it or not, the only all-weather port in the 18th century between Norfolk, Virginia, and Halifax, and Boston. Here we are in the middle, and also the North River is strategic. Um, we're here. Now, one of the things about the 18th century is you can't, it's very hard to hold territory. Um, you have, because the range of firepower is only about 50 to 100 yards. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> you can't really hold a lot, of, a lot of acres doing that. So what you can do is you can concentrate power and you can take, central points. You can't really hold lines, though. But New Long Island is an exception, and it's an exception because they have naval supremacy. So they can actually put their loyalists out to, to pasture on Long Island. Long Island, unfortunately, parallels over 120 miles of Connecticut coast. And one of the problems here is that the loyalists who are getting hungry by the time it's apparent that the, the British aren't going to be able to win, um, can uh, attack anywhere they want and help themselves, and which they proceed to do, beginning in 1779 and going in for the rest of the war. And there's this enormous kidnapping fest which goes on. Now, that's bad. It could have been worse. It could have been a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath in, in other places, New Jersey and um, the Carolinas. I've often wondered why it wasn't about Bloodbath, and it occurred to me in my uh, what, age, having thought about this problem for a long time and making, you know, preparing for this lecture, that one of the reasons why is that these guys are actually just as vulnerable as these guys. So they, you know, they, ha they had to be, it, it was easier to tap down um, because everyone is vulnerable to everyone else, but it was really miserable. 
And you couldn't ignore it, so you, or you'd lose control of the, um, the territory. So you had to defend, but you couldn't defend effectively. So the net, net effect of that was you went broke trying. Now, you might ask, where's the Connecticut line? The Connecticut line is stationed here, defending the strategic uh, North River. So that, that's, that's what uh, sunk us. And it means that the uh, leadership of a state that had brought Connecticut in as a, as a uh, star in the early phases of the revolution um, uh, was disgraced by the outcome. They, they were exhausted, prostrate, and uh, in deep trouble. And their prospects in the immediate post-war period are bleak, to put it mildly, because there are no new lands. Congress uh, passes judgment against Connecticut's title to North Central Pennsylvania, as well it might have. And at the end of 1782, our commerce with the West Indies is compromised by the um, restrictions of Europe's commercial empires. And we've got a tax system that is unduly dependent on poles, on uh, population. And uh, this is what happens when you do that. If you raise taxes, they just get in their, their wagons and leave. So that, that res restrains your ability to respond. Now, um, actually, uh, Walter spent a, a fair amount of time six weeks ago talking about the immigration, particularly in 1817, where, where they really left <laughs> in enormous quantities. But this had been going on for a long time. It had been going on since uh, 1750. And uh, during the 1790s, it is rumored that as many as 100,000 people left Connecticut. So, you know, it, it, it's not new. It's been going all, on all the time. And its relevance to um, what Connecticut federalism is sort of double-edged. That is, you know, it's a, when everyone is trying to leave, it's not a good show. On the other hand, you're getting rid of the troublemakers, so you're still in control. So it's a mixed bag, it seems to me. I just wanted to, that's a, a digression, uh, but I wanted to uh, make, make that clear. So anyway, so they emerge, the leadership uh, emerges, uh, what, compromised by the results of a war. But there are some, what, ironic consequences to this, and one of them is that it allows them to avoid the great mistake that Massachusetts made in 1785, which was to lay a direct tax on its population to try and blaze a trail to solvency, that is to pay off the revolutionary debts um, in this way. And that what Massachusetts wanted to do was show that it could be done without getting into bed with the Virginians, whom they distrusted. They didn't want a strong centralized government because they thought they'd be overwhelmed in that, and how that relates to Connecticut Federalists is that Connecticut's a smaller state than Massachusetts, so you know it has to. If it's going to have any weight at all, it has to play ball. Well, they could. They didn't have the capacity to play ball in 1785, and that was a, a great mercy, because what Shays' Rebellion um, succeeded in doing, and here's a, a, a picture which I really like because I like the colors, and I like one other. Thing about it. Here's where the court was sitting, and uh, here, here, here are the uh, rioters, and there are not very many of them, and that, which demonstrates something uh, very important, it seems to me, and that is the fragility of state power in this period. It's very fragile and can be disrupted very easily. Doesn't mean you can't come back, back and mop the, um, the, the rioters, but it takes time and it costs a lot of money. And you have to do it with the cooperation of other local entities. So uh, it, it puts a, you under restraint. But it was a mercy that Connecticut avoided that one. And uh, it, that empowers the people who have, wouldn't have pursued that course um, from Connecticut to, uh, it re-empowers them. It allows the Connecticut delegation in the Philadelphia Convention to play a key role that you've all heard of the Connecticut Compromise, you don't have to go into that. More importantly, there's no significant opposition to ratification of the Constitution in the state ratifying convention. And then, lo and behold, Hamilton's plan bails Connecticut out. Now this is something that uh, I think is 
important. Um, Hamilton's achievement. You've heard, undoubtedly, you've been all taught that Hamilton had a vision of a modern industrial state, which is absolute nonsense. He had no such thing. But he was a brilliant fi financer. And what he succeeded in doing was transforming a universal liability, which was the revolutionary debt, into a, a universal asset. And that's cool. Um, and the, the way he did that was by getting by financing it through the revenue derived from the impost. And the impost was the one tax you could actually collect with everyone consenting to it because we're still in a colonial economy and you can roll the tax into the price of the goods. You can actually get the merchants to collect it for you. That's so a really sweet tax. And you don't pay it unless you individually consent to pay it, which is, um, you know, where, where a revolution has started in protest to taxation. So this is, you know, taxation with consent in a very direct and personal way. Now, but to do that, you have to have a uniform impost or you're gonna be in trouble because if you break it up, then the entities will compete with each other and compromise its yield. And the other thing is you have to have all the debtors in one place because if there are two debts and one's being funded and the other isn't, then you're going to have some major opposition. So he has to assume the state debts, and he has to assume Connecticut's debt. And that's just delightful, because it gets us out of trouble. And if there was ever a time, then it was the best of times. It was between 1791 and 1796, when the burden of war debt was lifted. Uh, Congress uh, actually confirmed title to the Western Reserve, which was the booby prize for losing the uh, Susquehanna lands, and the state actually succeeds in selling it for, for money, or the promise of money, it turns out. But, you know, it's almost the same thing at that point. And then the, the West India trade revives with the Jay Treaty alignment of the United States with Britain. But all is not entirely well. There are clouds on the horizon. And the clouds are, first of all, that the New England is losing stature in relation to the rest of the country. So that, that's clearly expanding faster than New England, which diminishes our, New England's voice in the Union. The second thing is that the state's commerce remains essentially a colonial economy dependent on the West Indies. And that if you have a two great colonial powers in the world at war with each other, then you're you know, in potential trouble. But even more important is that the European war makes good relations with one of great powers, bad relations with the other. And that's demonstrated in the quasi-war of 1798-1800 uh, with France. Um, and uh, it, it, that's one of the things that really scares the daylights out of the um, uh, Connecticut Federalists with Jefferson's election in 1800 because they fear his sympathies for France, which are well known, will lead to a war with England, which in turn would necessitate an alliance with France, which would you know, put us into the arms of France and Frenchify or Jacobinize or whatever you want us. And uh, they don't like that. And, and they would like this to be a temporary mirage, but it's clear that the, the political revolution of 1800 is going to be irreversible. First of all, because of the 12th Amendment, which deprives the Federalists of the kind of leverage they had in the election of 1800, choosing between the two top uh, Federalist uh, vote getters. But even more important, because of the Louisiana Purchase, which doubles the size of the nation. And so here's poor old little New England way over here, and it's pumping out all sorts of people in this direction, but they don't really like what's left back there. And the future obviously belongs to the Republicans. And um, so that, that's a, a very sober, sobering experience, which seems to be confirmed by the election of 1804, where Connecticut is the only state in New England that gives a Federalist candidate any electoral votes. Then the uh, situation really begins to, to uh, unravel badly with the intensification of the European war after 1805, and uh, which increases the chances of a British war. Um, and the reason for that is Britain establishes its supremacy at land, Napoleon on, uh, excuse me, on the sea, Napoleon on land. They can't get each other except through, guess what? Our, our commerce. We've become the largest neutral carrier 
in the world, and that's actually the thing that's making um, Hamilton's fiscal program work, namely that uh, we that that came to bail it out, as it were. Um, but uh, that, that creates problems because b both of these big bullies are after us simultaneously, and what Jefferson does is respond with an embargo. Now, the embargo has a very bad reputation among, uh, among historians. I disagree with that. I think uh, the embargo wasn't so s stupid. Um, and actually, if you'd taken a referendum on it, which uh, I, I, I don't recommend under most circumstances, it would probably have passed. Because these people had been through a revolution, knew what a war was like, being fought in their backyard, and were grateful that they were being spared it in the early 19th century. But the Federalists disagreed and um, saw it as an opportunity, and they also demonized it as a Napoleonic measure. And uh, Timothy Pickering, who'd been a Secretary of State, even went so far as to say that, that Napoleon had dictated it to to Jefferson, who had just folded before his pressure, which is absolute nonsense. Um, but it did help to authorize Connecticut to contribute to its subversion, which they did rather enthusiastically. And uh, it did collapse in 1809. Now, it collapsed because there was a lot of encouragement from Britain, including uh, telling everyone that uh, American vessels without proper clearances would be welcome in British ports and also adjusting the orders in council so to, so to facilitate the provisioning of, of the British army in the Iberian Peninsula. But um, Connecticut, ironically, is not that reassured by their success in opposing the embargo. And they do something very strange, and that is they recall their big gun, James Hillhouse, who is the, the, the one guy who really is on a par with the Massachusetts leadership. And they, Massachusetts leadership listens to him, and he's been proposing constitutional amendments for, since the beginning of time. Uh, and, he, and he's a very impressive guy, but they bring him back, back home to run the school fund. That's more important than national affairs? Uh, well, anyway, they thought so. And why do they think so? Because their principal identity has become exemplifying a uniquely stable Republican state. But that renounces any kind of revolutionary vanguardism that ha they demonstrated early on in 1775 and 76. And it's a terribly defensive attitude towards what they're trying to protect. And it disqualifies them from resisting the war with Britain in 1812. Uh, it, it happens anyway. Um, and it's very unwelcome because they haven't forgotten the challenges of a revolutionary war. And Napoleon is the height of his power. But they feel that there's no choice but to resist. And, of course, they've, they've uh, had some experience with resisting the embargo. They do the same thing in, in the War of 1812. They refuse to place their militia under federal command. They obstruct the recruitment of, a, their, of their citizens into the U.S. armed forces. And they do this in curious ways. I mean, they raise a state force offering twice the pay scale of the United States Army to draw young men out of the United States Army more than to defend the state. And um, they also informally harass recruiters. And if you're a recruiting officer and you get a recruit, you're apt to be slapped with a writ of habeas corpus to cough the guy back up. It's, it becomes a bad scene. But they have to cooperate with the federal forces in 1813 in defending New London. That's because James, uh, Stephen Decatur brought in HMS Macedonian, a British frigate, to New London. He got this on, on the screen, a, a British fleet. Uh, they didn't all fire their broadsides simultaneously. This is, <laughs> forget about that. But it, it, nonetheless, made one think twice about what one was doing next, and they didn't want a repetition of Arnold's raid of 1781. So, and actually, the feds made it easy for them to cooperate. But that all disappears at the beginning of 1814 with a raid on uh, Petabai Point in April of that year. And that came about because uh, Connecticut, uh, at the end of 1813, said, we're not going to defend our coast. It's your war. You do it. Uh, um, or we'll own, and we'll, we will cooperate if you pay. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the Fed said, well, we're prepared to pay, but you have to put your forces under our command. And that was not a deal. So the fort in Saybrook is allowed to uh, become unoccupied. The British find out about it, come up, burn 25, 26 vessels. And, um, you know, that, that's sort of a, a basic humiliation on all sides. Connecticut realizes it has to, to do a little better than that. <laughs> um, so, but but it, it, there isn't much between that and the Hartford Convention. And I think this illustration is supposed to be this room. Is that, is that right? It's here, right here, right, right where we are right now, yes. And there they are. They all look so proper, and they look all wise and patriotic, and they produce this thing, the, uh, uh, the proceedings of the, the Convention of Delegates. The convention is a brainchild of Massachusetts, incidentally, and Connecticut, um, once again, feels as though it has really no choice but to, to uh, fall into line. A lot of scholarly energy has been devoted to, to telling us that the convention was, wasn't as bad as it looked, and I'm going to argue that it's actually worse than it looked, and that everyone at the time knew that. Um, because what's involved, what they're doing here, and I'm going to go to the next slide, is they know there's a British expeditionary force um, proceeding against New Orleans, and they expect that expeditionary force to win because they ha hold southern militias in contempt. They think the South can't defend itself because of slavery. And the, the, after all, the, the expeditionary force is Wellington's veterans from the Peninsula War, and they, they're battle-tested troops. And so when the British end up taking that position, what do they control? The whole rest of the country, its future, and everything else. And so what, what is the Madison administration's um, options going to be? Well, they're going to have to turn to the only people who are friends of the, the Brits in the United States, and that's the Feds, Federalists. And, and, so, and they're naming their price in advance. Their price is, you know, we're gonna, we want a constitutional revision. Now, they actually tone it down a little, but if um, the, it had come to push, it had come to shove, and, and the administration had yielded, it, the price probably would have gone right up. What they really wanted to get rid of was the three-fifths clause. Um, so when they lose the bet, and they don't take, the British don't take New Orleans, and instead the Republicans get a, an honorable peace, they are, uh, they, they, in effect, anyone associated with the Hartford Convention has lost all credibility, particularly if they think they're exemplifying an ideal republicanism, because these people are a minority, and in a republic, a majority is supposed to run the show. And of course, it didn't help, but they were simultaneously pioneering the nullifying of a, of a federal law. Uh, but both behaviors made them vulnerable to everyone that um, Walter had talked about as thinking this was not the best of all worlds. So this defensive ideology, I have argued, had led them in a, into a cul-de-sac, which, uh, once again, another irony, maybe I should have a little irony button, um, Actually, their vulnerability um, has an advantage. It, it convinces, it, they realize that their opponents are going to work within the system. So it's not going to be like France. And then, much to their surprise and also the Republicans' surprise, they're more Federalists in that convention than, than anyone expected. And the Constitution of 1818 actually is far better to the hole they found themselves and dug themselves into by 1815 because it embodies many values shared by, with their opponents. So, you know, they, in the convention they realize, you know, that they occupy, occupy the same world to a large extent. But the most important thing, final irony, is this. Now, this is the beginning of peace, the, quintess, the quintessential battle of the, the Napoleonic Wars. This is Wellington Squares resisting the uh, French cavalry charge at Waterloo. It puts an end to 20 years of constant warfare with only one brief intermission and ushers in over, well, actually France and Britain have never been at each other's throats since then. So um, it, it brings about a peaceful world and if I'm right that to understand what's really going on in Connecticut, you have to look beyond the borders of a state and maybe even beyond the borders of the country 
This, I think, is the most significant thing in, in bringing back about the pacification of Connecticut politics with the Constitution of 1818. Thank you. So I'm, I, I, do we have time for questions or no? Yeah, a few questions, if anyone wants to ask a question. Yes, sir. Finished up and peace was already in effect when the Battle of New Orleans was in, in force. How did that affect the convention and public opinion at the time? Well, the, the answer is that they, no one knew it at the time. There, there's a time lag uh, at that time of year. It takes as much as six weeks. To, it, c it can be done in about four weeks. Um, so there's a time lag and, the, and they don't find out about the peace of Ghent until uh, early February. It was the same time uh, shortly afterwards, maybe a day or two afterwards, they, they received news of the victory at New Orleans. So uh, that, it was a double whammy. But meanwhile, of course, the state had sent its commissioners with Massachusetts and Rhode Island commissioners down to Washington to receive the Madison administration's surrender. <laughs> and you could, you could imagine what they felt like <laughs> when they learned out of it learned about this, they had to crawl back, <laughs> uh, disgraced. Yeah. If the Hartford Convention was the brainchild of Massachusetts, why was it held here? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, because uh, first of all, it, it, they, they thought they could get away with it. Secondly, they wanted to demonstrate that it wasn't just a Massachusetts cabal that was running the opposition um, to the war, but it was embarrassing. It was called by the, uh, the uh, Massachusetts legislature um, in response to the release of the uh, initial terms of uh, British negotiators again that made it look as though the war was, was you know, going to go on forever because they were just impossible terms. No, no one in America could accept them. So uh, that, that made the uh, Massachusetts Federalists, what, uh, desperate, but they needed to cover their tracks. They, they wanted to share the burden as much as possible, and they persuaded the Connecticut guys to go along with them. Uh, and, you know, they went along willingly, I think, because at that point, you know, there didn't seem to be any, any uh, uh, alternative. And the other thing is, they didn't know how wide the response to the convention would be, and, you know, Hartford is closer to uh, other areas than Boston is. So, you know, if New York wanted to join the fun, they could come in, and it was also equally accessible to northern New England. So Maine is still part of Massachusetts at this, at this time. Does that help a little? Okay, yeah. The question I would have would be, what was the, um, what was the uh, role of the increasing numbers of religious dissenters Episcopalians, Methodists, and Baptists especially in the erosion of Federalist power, say, between 1790 and 1850. Well, yeah, my answer to that's going to um, be, be devious. <laughs> my first response is not much. But it is, it, um, the growth of dissent is significant in a very indirect way in my reading, and that is it betrays an unstable economy that is developing in ways that people aren't familiar with, and I think that worries traditional Federalists. They're, 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 they want to cling, basically, to the past. That, uh, that was a great period. Not that it was that great, but that's what they think it was. And uh, so, so, you know, I don't think the... Uh, Religious dissent is a big deal at this time. I think Bob is going to uh, reinforce that opinion in the, in the autumn. Um, but, but when it comes to dividing up money, and they had a debate over the bonus bill, you know, and, and then you get really tense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm struck. Dick, by, um, in, in the book Original Discontents, which you edited and selected, mm. uh, much of the, the writing in there is from the newspapers uh, mm. in Connecticut at the mm. time. 
and they're incendiary. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot about Jacobins and mm -hmm. you know the whole thing. And it and it really, uh, if you are reading as much as we do think people read in taverns and so on, those kinds of papers in those years, you, you would be incited uh, by the flame of the rhetoric. Whereas you're kind of presenting a much milder view of, of well, what went on. And well, so I just, the, it interests I, me. Uh, so uh, we should take the rhetoric literally. Well, well it does reflect something. But they're so dredged in it that they become they immunize themselves to its incendiary effect. So that would be my justification for me describing it in such a neutral tone. But it does reinforce my argument, which is that you know there's a lot more going on here, and the potential is a lot more volcanic than you might expect. Yeah, yeah, Bob. I guess it's a chicken or egg question. I mean the. The stories that you tell, uh, to me, strike me as a period of inept leadership uh, uh, in the state and the area, uh, and and maybe it was the conflicts of of uh, the battles that were going that prevented leadership. But this this wasn't a great period of Connecticut mm -hmm. producing, you know, national brilliant people. The, the Revolutionary War in the 1850s. Later, you hear about, you know. Pretty dominant people. Well, the, the uh, we don't remember the leadership of the state particularly because they disgraced themselves. That's true. Uh, the prominence of leaders is, is often a product of the structures they managed to inhabit as much as their own brilliance. There was one brilliant descendant of the revolutionary governor, and that's Jonathan. Trumbull Jr., who was governor, and he died in 1809. He wasn't so bad, but you know we were we were playing games with the embargo <laughs> at that time. So uh, yeah, I mean you're you're right. Uh, we uh, there are no giants from this period, but we've buried them because we're uh, there's nothing to be terribly proud of. If you if I, I'm afraid, if, and if we really explored it in detail, um, it would all come out. So that's why we bury them. Uh, that's my interpretation. I, maybe I shouldn't be saying that in this, uh, this, these hallowed halls, but <laughs> yeah. I, I want to return to the uh, Hartford Convention yeah. and some of its proposals. Um, to modern ears, uh, some of the amendments that they have proposed, uh, term limits and uh, yeah. two-thirds majority for declaring war, mm -hmm. would strike many as good policy, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, the Hartford Convention as a whole is, is treated rather poorly in history. Um, how much of that is really, though, uh, the propaganda of the times? If you're Republicans in a minority in Connecticut, of course you're going to uh, say, you know, the convention was a disaster. Um, and, you know, it seems like one of the primary things you hear is that they wanted to secede from uh, the Union. And that's the reason that uh, uh, the Hartford Convention has such a bad name. But that does not seem to well, be true that there was that. It, well, there, there are ways to, you know, it's true that they didn't uh, say, I am committing treason or we are seceding. Um, and there would have been a price for doing that. So I didn't do that. I don't think anyone in their right minds who is committing treason says, hey, hey, can I get two witnesses before I commit treason? But look, look what they're doing. There's, they are betting on this. <laughs> naming their terms, sending commissioners to receive the surrender of a administration which they think will be at their mercy because the British will control, control the future development of, of the United States and the only people who will be able to talk to them are their friends, namely the Federalists. And um, <laughs> I just, I don't, I, you know, I, that, that, this to me is obscene. <laughs> they shouldn't have done it. And they did it. And they did it. Um, uh, well, I, I discuss why they did it. I, I think they understood that they were in deep water even before they got there uh, because they'd been threatening to do it for so long they had to do something or lose all credibility. So they got themselves a little bit trapped by their own strategies. Now, I'm talking about Massachusetts more than Connecticut. Connecticut has to go along because it's, if, if it isn't set second fiddle, it's nothing. So, so it plays second fiddle. Uh, hi, I was just wondering if uh, you could talk 
because you went really quickly over it, because I know it's not the main por portion of your, uh, your, your lecture today, but the, the role the Federalists played in the Constitutional Convention of uh, 1818 in terms of like what incentivized them to, to go along with it, and did they actually feel like this was maybe like a bad idea, that like, because it seems that they revered their charter so much that well, that they would well, do that. a charter wasn't doing them that much good to put a mile, I mean, they, you know, the charter was really vulnerable to, it was a royal charter, Charles II. You know, it was, a, it was a, it, get, moving on to 200 years old. <laughs> it, it had everything wrong with it. And, uh, and the, the other thing is they just got elected to the convention. And once they were there, you know, they got themselves into debates with, with um, Republicans and they found out, you know, they could actually talk to these guys. And they actually, slowed down or, or helped to avoid some of the more radical changes the Republicans wanted, like um, district election of assistants or the upper house as opposed to general election, things like that. And, uh, but they accepted things like the, the division of powers. Um, so, you know, it, it, they, they actually, I, my own feeling is they found out how much they shared in common. Uh, uh, when, when the heat came off, when, when uh, you know, peace was established in Europe. That you know, that was just so important. You you had a question back there, and then I think we we have to stop, don't we? Sometimes, yeah. Uh, in in the context of uh, my uh, suspicion that uh, Connecticut political history is particularly ridden with uh, with derogatory cliches having to do with the standing order and. Uh, uh, the the uh, steady habits and so on and so forth, uh, all implying a, a leaden conservatism that rules Connecticut all the way from the 17th century through 1818. Uh, I'm wondering wh whether that isn't overdone. My, my, my own strong suspicion is it is overdone, uh, that in fact there are many aspects of the standing order that can be regarded as, uh, uh, as uh, exemplary of a, a, kind of, a, a kind of progressive leadership uh, in, in a colonial society. But uh, uh, to, to bear down on, on my point, now that I've been able to give a little speech, uh, uh, I wanted to push back against the, the, the earlier uh, discussion about uh, there being no, no outstanding leadership in, in Connecticut. My impression is that James Hillhouse, who you, uh, who you cited, is in fact an extraordinary character who perhaps ha hasn't gotten uh, mu much attention. He is uh, one, one of the, uh, he, he is an early proponent of Barring slavery uh, from uh, the Louisiana Territory, uh, he uh, he is in favor of the uh, Missouri Compromise before Missouri. Not not that that would have ultimately saved the country, but uh, uh, am, am I wrong about about Hill House, about whom the only thing uh, uh, that that is remembered is that uh, a high school is named after him in in, uh, in uh, New Haven. Well, he, he's a very important f fellow. Uh, there's a problem with his papers, as I recall. Um, the, they're under restriction. They're held by Yale, and you, mm. you, can't, you can't get into a lot of them. And I, and there, I suspect there's probably a reason for that, but I'm not, not sure what it is. Now, the, the first part of your question was, um, I've, I've mischaracterized the Federalists as, as uh, what? Bastions of reaction, and uh, they were really more progressive than I've given. No, no, but uh, but 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 people have. Yeah, well, individual Federalists were forward-looking people, like David Humphreys was a you know he, he was a prominent Federalist, had been had a wonderful career and diplomatic career, and came back uh, with a merino sheep that the King of Spain had given him, and and tried to to uh, revive the agricultural fortunes of, of um, Connecticut. And Oliver Walcott Jr., the guy who presided over the convention of 1818 and moderated between Federalists and uh, Republicans, had been Secretary of Treasury <clears throat> under Washington Adams. He was uh, Hamilton's successor, was a Federalist to begin with, but um, signed off when it came to Federalist res resistance to the War of 1812. He just couldn't tolerate that. And, Incidentally, if you want bad behavior, I mean, I've just scratched the surface of bad behavior, but the bad behavior that has really, really needs more attention than it's received is the bad behavior of Massachusetts banks in Boston who did everything they could to bankrupt 
the government and, and immobilize uh, the, the United States during the campaign of 1814. By, and, uh, and they did that in cahoots with the British, um, <laughs> which is the way they operated. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so uh, th th they were bad. <laughs>